Ward. Okay. Uh, Drew is the principal of Meyerson Quest Limited, a US and China based consultancy specializing in corporate transformation and uh, mergers and acquisitions. Prior to launching uh, Meyerson Quest in 2007, Drew established and then ran Bacardi's China operating com companies and led one of China's first foreign foreign invested television production enterprises and managed new product development marketing for Bristol Myers Squibb China division. Drew first went to China in 1986 on a Yale China Association teaching fellowship. He later ran China based epidemiology studies for the US National Cancer Institute and the Chinese Academy of Medical Sciences. Drew speaks Mandarin and holds a BA in history with additional concentration in biochemistry from Yale, an MBA in finance from Wharton and an MA in international studies and Chinese from UPenn and the Louder Institute. Drew is also an adjunct professor in the global leadership program at SMU's Cox School of Business. Drew and his wife Vivi live in Princeton with their two children, Jamin and Zoe, who are both madrich at the Jewish Center Religious School. And I always have to put a little bit of a statement in when I've had a student, one of them as a student, and I've had the pleasure of having Zoe as a student in the Zion class. So with that, I will hand the program over to Drew. Ellen, thank you so much for that. And uh, you know, I wanted to also thank the whole TJC community for welcoming my family when we first came here about a year and a half ago. Uh, the arms have been open to me and my kids and my wife and we feel completely at home. So I know there are a lot of folks that we know on this uh, call, a lot of folks we don't. I just wanted to thank everybody for that, uh, for that warm welcome we've been given and uh, a welcome home. Um, this presentation, uh, the whole, the, the topic I have to say is a real head scratcher for a lot of people. And thank you, Moshe, for giving me that line. Um, you know, most people don't equate uh, Jews with China and China with Jews. Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty wacky topic. But honestly, I hope over the course of the next 45 minutes or so, you will see like I do, that it's a, it's a story full of intrigue and fortune hunting and escape and empire building and ultimately finding a home. Um, and for my family and me, it's also full of a, a couple of personal stories, some of which I'll share with you tonight. So let me see if I could push my screen to you guys. Uh-oh. The host has disabled screen sharing. Ellen, can you help me with that? Um, yeah, I'm not able to share my screen because you've disabled it. I, hold on. Yeah. I think with our 20 minutes of kibitzing, we would have figured that out. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, try it now. Okay. There you go. Okay, great. There we go. You don't need to see the next pages. Let's get rid of this. Okay, so I, I know the uh, the published topic of this was supposed to be the history of Jews in Shanghai, but it's, you know, most of these stories are related to or focused on Shanghai, but a lot of the earlier ones are in different parts of China. Um, and, you know, as I mentioned, it is a story full of many stories. Uh, in fact, what most people won't realize is that there are actually five different waves of Jewish migration. Uh, one form of diaspora or another uh, where Jews ended up in China. Uh, and some of these populations stayed for hundreds of years, even thousands of years. Um, so I'm going to take you through each one of these one by one. Um, and as Ellen mentioned, you're free to interject with questions if some are topic specific, but you're also free to hold them to the end. So let me take you through this great wild story. Um, so first, just a primer on this, uh, on this map so that everybody gets themselves oriented. Uh, you'll see circles and arrows and lines and 
hatches and things like that in a couple of these places. Uh, that one long line is the initial route. So that the, the punch line of the first wave is that town called Kaifeng at the end of the line. You see that? Um, there's a bit of the story about that town in the upper right with an arrow pointing to it called Harbin. Uh, and then of course my, my hometown of Shanghai is the, the center of most of these stories. So now you know where most of those are. Okay, so let's jump into the, uh, the first wave. <clears throat> The first wave, you know, some of you may have heard of these famous Kaifeng Jews. Kaifeng Jews actually started making their way towards China uh, more than a thousand years ago. Um, and, you know, there, they were, some of them were silk traders, some of them were spice traders, uh, some of them were bringing uh, goods and technology from the West to, to China. Uh, but they were traveling over this, this famous silk route uh, that had linked China to the West for for a while at that point. Um, they were from the Middle East, they were from Persia, some of them were from India. Um, they, most of them were, were going for economic reasons uh, for ex or for exploratory reasons, but some of them actually were, were on their way as fast as they could to, to escape from, from the Crusades. Um, they, uh, they arrived in, in China, were uh, gravitated towards the uh, basically the center of all trade and the center of all commerce and, and politics, which was the, the city of Kaifeng, which was the, the, the court for the northern Song dynasty, which is where the, the, the emperor was based in those days. And uh, unlike many parts of the story and many, many stories of the, of the Jewish diaspora, they were welcomed with open arms by the emperor. Uh, the emperor not only was curious about them, uh, he was interested in the outside world. I think part of it had to do with his interest in global domination to a certain extent. Uh, but he was very welcoming to them, curious about the knowledge that they brought. Um, and he welcomed them into the court. Um, and some of them actually were invited to take on very important roles as his advisor. Uh, there was a court astronomer. Um, they were given titles and land uh, and welcome to stay uh, and live in Kaifeng and the areas around Kaifeng. Uh, in fact, they were even allowed to marry, uh, which uh, other in invaders from Japan, for example, were not uh, allowed to marry Chinese people by, by imperial writ. Um, and uh, he liked them so much that he even gave them Chinese names. So in Kaifeng, uh, if you go there to this day, uh, there are quite a few people who don't look 100% Chinese whose last names are Ai or Shi Gao, Gan, Jin, Li, Zhang, and Zhao. If you scratch them deeply enough, you may discover that they've got some, some Jewish blood in them. So these are, these are just some pictures. These are from the, the, the Jewish uh, uh, Museum in Kaifeng. Uh, these were period depictions, uh, paintings that were made at the time of uh, Jews arriving in Kaifeng and um, getting the blessing uh, from the emperor. Um, they were <clears throat> there and rooted long enough uh, by the 12th century that they built a beautiful synagogue uh, in the Sephardi style, as you can tell, um, which was actually it was one of several synagogues, but this was the main one and the one that lasted longer than any of the others. Uh, it's, it's got a bit of a Japanese roof style, but uh, I think that was more due to local materials and architects that were available. But the inside is pure, you know, Sephardi shul as we know it even to this day. Um, it was built in 1163. Uh, it was referred to as the Temple of Purity and Truth. Beautiful name. Um, and it was, uh, it was blessed by the, the emperor and uh, Jewish life uh, thrived there. Uh, for many years. Uh, there, there was quite a bit of uh, uh, intermarriage starting from, let's say, the 15th, 16th, and 17th century. Uh, by the time uh, the temple was destroyed, actually, in 1861, um, it was not, it, it, there was an active community there, but the, the, the shul was being used less and less, and the, Jew, the Jewish community there had assimilated to a certain extent. But there was, in fact, a synagogue there from 1163 to 1861. And if you go to Kaifeng now, you'll see uh, remnants of life, Jewish life from those days. Uh, in fact, 
folks from National Geographic made a really interesting exploratory trip in 1907 and took pictures of people. You see the, the faces on the left, in particular, the taller woman with a fan. Uh, that looks like a slightly less than Chinese Chinese face if you, if you take a close look at it. Um, so these are some pictures of Kaifeng Jews. Uh, there's uh, the temple. Um, this is the edge of the old cemetery at the bottom right. You'll see it had fallen into disrepair. I think it was a bit of a, a swamp at that point. Just some more pictures of Kaifeng Jews from visits that were made in the, the late 19th and early, early 20th century, Kaifeng life. And again, here's some, here's some clear pictures. The, the gentleman with the, with the ponytail in the middle of the picture, you know, he is Chinese. He is from Jewish lineage. This, this was a, uh, I think it was a wood carving that was made in the 18th century, the early 1700s. So this was a time when the Kaifeng Jews had been there for eight, 900 years already. Um, so that they had withstood uh, intermarriage to the point where that man has a nose almost as big as my own. Um, and you know, you can see the typical Svarti uh, Torah box, uh, which uh, were, were kept um, and there are some now in the in the uh, in the museum there in Kaifeng, some more relics. And then this one, uh, I'm not quite sure what to make of this, but a friend of mine went to Kaifeng in 20, 2008, and this is before they had recognized how uh, valuable their Jewish heritage was and set up uh, you know real tourism for Jews. Uh, but he was taken. He met a he met a Jew. He was taken to this place that was supposedly the site of the historic mikvah of of Kaifeng. And, you know, clearly it's, it wasn't in, maintained in very good shape. I think those are like pharmaceutical labels and garbage dump. And I think there's like a, a motorcycle parked in the corner of one of those. But he was told, um, and evidence shows that this was the site of the uh, side house off of the synagogue. And the assumption has always been that this was somehow part of the ceremonial mikvah kaifeng. Uh, and here we go. These are the Ten Commandments in Chinese. Um, so this was uh, part of, apparently this was part of the Kaifeng Temple when it was destroyed. This was taken by, um, I want to say there was a, a group of French explorers who were there at the time and bought this. Um, it is now back in the museum in Kaifeng. Now, there are still Jews in Kaifeng. In fact, it's a very, very interesting population, a very interesting story. Um, these are families who can trace their lineage back to those days. Uh, the Chinese government in doing their census actually tracks this kind of stuff and they recognize four, four to 500 Jews uh, based in Kaifeng. Uh, they themselves can, you know, there are more of them that, 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 that uh, can trace their lineage. About a thousand of them claim to have Jewish lineage. Um, and some of them are quite active, as you can tell. Uh, not many, you know, 40, 50, maybe 60 or so are act, actual, actually practicing. These are, these are real pictures from Kaifeng. You know, young boys wrapping tefillin, you know, saying their prayers, um, uh, doing all of the things that uh, we recognize so well. Um, and I've, I've also met a lot of other Kaifeng Jews, some of them in Shanghai, actually, some of them in Israel. Um, and the kind of things that you hear them say are those, like those quotes down at the bottom right, you know, my grandfather always wore a blue skull cap and told me someday we will return to our homeland. Um, my family never eats pork. I, my family never eats pork, but I never knew why. You know, they're not of one of the Islamic uh, minority groups in China, but for some reason, their families never ate pork. It was all part of that, that same tradition that was handed down. Drew, can I, I have a question uh, about the Ten Commandments from Mindy. Yeah. On the Ten Commandments, what are the last two characters on the left that are the same in the columns? Uh, it means you can't. Please don't kill, yeah, thou shalt not, essentially. Okay, thank yeah. you. Sure. So, um, you know, China has a very awkward relationship with religion in general. Um, they only recognize five religions. Uh, Judaism is not a recognized religion. Um, they tend to get 
uh, uncomfortable with the practice of religion. And it goes in waves and it's gone in waves since the Cultural Revolution that not just Jews, but other, other religious groups have been fallen under a certain amount of persecution. Um, and the Kaifeng Jews are no exception to that. Um, it's not been an easy life to be a self-identifying Jew in Kaifeng. Um, I've been told by many people I've met from there that there's, there's always a sense of foreboding that at some point, you know, they will be taken away or their, their, their homes will be taken from them. They'll be forced out of Kaifeng, they'll be separated. Um, so when the relationship between the state of Israel and uh, China, when the two countries recognized each other in 1992, there was, quite a, there was an interesting grassroots organization of people who knew the story of the Kaifeng Jews, had followed them, and might have had some relationship to people from China who lobbied the Shavai Israel organization to arrange uh, essentially an airlift of uh, Kaifeng Jews. Uh, and of course, they had to pass all of the tests and they had to prove their, their lineage. Um, and some of them had to physically convert because in China it's patrilineal uh, and they couldn't find their matrilineal lines. Uh, but I think about 20 of, in the first group went through that whole process and landed in Eretz Israel in, in October of 2009. Um, this, this guy on the right was a uh, just a guy that I met. I, I took a group of Chinese business people to Israel a few years ago, and he was our tour guide. And he came from a family that knew they were, they were not practicing Jews per se, but they knew they were Jewish. They knew that everybody else knew that they were Jewish. And he said to me when, I, when we, we were alone, the two of us sat down, we were talking about what he remembered from Kaifeng. This line at the, the lower left is something he said to me. He said, after the cemetery was destroyed, my grandmother pulled me over and she said, if you can go to Israel, you should. Hmm. And so did. I have a question, uh, Drew, as, as if the Jews had they, if there's a new synagogue for them, they, are they in a new synagogue? So there are, there's no such thing as an, a, a sanctioned synagogue in all of China. Synagogues are not permitted. Um, so in a place like Haifeng, where there's not enough of a, a minion, as it were, uh, you, you'll see these these pictures are, they're essentially in people's homes. Um, this is not a synagogue. Uh, the one on the right is not a synagogue. I think actually it might be, it might be a church. Um, I know that there are, you know, some underground Jewish populations in other parts of China that also have been somewhat protected and, and facilitated by local churches that are sanctioned by the state. So there's no, there's no synagogue like that. Um, now, uh, we'll get to this later when we, when we talk, to the modern, talk about the modern Jews and the Shanghai-based Jews. There are buildings that were synagogues. And in some cases, they are permitted to be used for services by Jewish communities. Uh, but they are not officially recognized by the Chinese state as synagogues. It's interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. It's a picture. So this is a one of my kind of personal funny stories. So the the, the lady on the right is my wife. Uh, the little mutt in the corner is my daughter, the one who just stuck her head in. So when I met my wife, she was a TV personality, and one of her gigs just before we got married was she was a VJ for MTV, and there was always this myth mythology about her which uh you know the folks in the pr world love to pump up and amplify uh to the point when you know when she was an mtv vj uh, her official bio had all of these uh references to her ancestry now her father is from kaifeng her father's family were intellectuals for tens of generations forever in kaifeng uh there is a link there there were stories. There was uh, quite a bit of anecdotal uh, uh, folklore about her lineage. And, you know, of course, a media organization like MTV, Viacom, uh, uh, jumped on that and said, look, you know, we're going we're gonna to do whatever we can with this. So when I met her, everybody I knew who knew her thought she was Jewish. And actually, if you take a look at her face, she looks a little less than 100% Chinese. Uh, so it's credible. A lot of people believed it. But this is her bio. Okay, she was part Jewish. Her ancestor Tan Ruang was a Jewish astronomer in the court of the Qin Dynasty. Uh, and then later there was another Jew who entered into her DNA. 
uh, this Jewish trader from Switzerland. So uh, we met, uh, we met almost 30 years ago now and got married almost 20 years ago now. And this is before the days of, of DNA testing. Uh, when we finally did do our, 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 our 23 and me, one of my reasons was, uh, you know, we absolutely have to find out if you had anything except for Chinese blood. And lo and behold, her DNA is 100% Han Chinese. So much for that bit. <laughs> All right, let's get into the second wave. This is a really interesting wave. Um, now, um, you, many of you probably know that there were uh, Jews of the diaspora <coughs> who, left, <coughs> um, who, who left the Middle East, who left Persia, who left India, and basically followed the British Raj wherever it went um, and you know, made their fortunes in real estate and in trading and in finance. Um, one of these huge Baghdadi populations was in Bombay. Um, it was Bombay and Goa, but it was mostly based around Bombay. Uh, there were a group of families who had been extremely successful. They were English-speaking Sephardic Jews um, who had, you know, made uh, made their fortunes over the course of a very short period of time. Uh, then uh, there were. It was basically the, the the son's generation was just coming of age. They were trying to figure out a way to differentiate themselves from their dads. And lo and behold, in 1842, uh, you may remember, some of you may have heard of the, the Opium Wars, uh, where uh, at the end of the Opium Wars, which were, it was a battle between the Chinese, Chinese uh, uh, emperor, imperial army, and a bunch of foreigners who were trying to sell opium up the Yangtze River. Uh, it didn't end well for the Chinese, and they ended up giving away some of their most treasured uh, coastal areas to foreigners as, as treaty ports. Uh, one of them was Shanghai. Now, Shanghai was given to uh, to become an international settlement, uh, partially uh, managed and run by by Britain. So, to these uh, uh, Mizrahi, Svardik, uh, uh, Baghdadi business people who were, you know, successful following the Raj wherever it went, this was the new frontier. So this whole gener this whole group of second generation sons were sent out by their fathers to what was essentially, it was a cesspool. Shanghai, you know, Shanghai's, at the best of times, is a very wet and moist place. But when they came, it was a fishing village. It was very hot. It was disgusting. What? There were very few people living there. It was the it's back it's horse it's of the and uh, they came and started buying up land. They saw a really interesting opportunity to build uh, essentially a, an embankment that, uh, on, on the Huangpu River uh, that emptied into the Yangtze, that emptied into the Pacific Ocean, knowing that would be an incredible trade route for any kind of trade going up the Yangtze River into the inner parts of China. Uh, for their tea, for their opium, for whatever it was they wanted to trade. And over the course of a period of the 1840s, 50s, 60s through the 80s, they settled their claims. They took over most of the prime parts of, of what is now Shanghai. And they built this incredible city that you now know. It was basically three families that led it. Uh, the, the Sassoons were the the, the straight-laced, uh, clean-collared bankers and uh, real estate developers. Uh, the, Kador, the Kadori family were, uh, they're a little bit lower down on the, on the scale of, of, uh, of, uh, of, of society. Uh, they were hoteliers and they, they owned, uh, they owned uh, utility companies and the plumbing company in those days. And then there were the Cardoons, which were, you know, their sons were scoundrels. They basically bought up old land. They were slum landlords and they, they, did, uh, they did all kinds of shyster stuff, but they ended up owning most of what's now downtown Shanghai at the end of it. So here's the, the famous Shanghai Bund. Any of you who've ever seen a picture of Shanghai, you've seen this one. Uh, on the left is uh, the Bund in the 20s, I would guess. Uh, bustling wild even then. These buildings were, uh, actually it was probably the early 30s. These buildings were all constructed in the late teens and 20s. But you could see, you know, from, from, the, from the 1920s onwards, this is a city that rivaled any modern megalopolis anywhere in the world already. 
uh, and it was built by basically by three families of, of Baghdadi Jews. Uh, and by the way, just, just parenthetically, Bund, the Shanghai Bund. Bund is not a German word. Most people think it's a German word. It's actually a Persian word for embankment. So there you go. There are your Baghdadi roots. Okay, here's some, some more pictures of the, the Peace Hotel. Uh, someone mentioned that's the, the original, I think that's a picture of opening day on the left. Uh, it was opened in 1929. And then this is the newly renovated, it's now the Fairmont Peace Hotel, but it's still a real icon right there on the Bund in China. It's an absolutely beautiful hotel. This is the Svartik synagogue that the Baghdadi uh, business people built for themselves. Um, I actually lived about two blocks from this building uh, for 10 years when I first moved back to Shanghai. Um, it's very much in a, it's a residential neighborhood. Um, it's now, it's quite far back from the road. As you can tell, it's covered in vines. Um, for the 19, after Chinese uh, liberation in 1949, it's been used as a government building and most recently as an education office. But beginning in about 19, no, sorry, 2005, the Jewish community was allowed to enter, then use it for social events. And then ultimately uh, about seven or eight years ago, uh, the Jewish community was allowed to use it for services five times a year. So this beautiful old shul still has a huge sign on the outside that says the Shanghai Education Bureau of blah, 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 Huangpu District goes on and on. It's a very, very long sign. Um, and you can't get in if you're white unless you've got, you know, an invitation and a passport and something that says you're Jewish. Uh, but five times a year, it is used as a shul again. And they lived high on the hog, these guys. They were among the richest people in the world. These were homes. There are many of those in Shanghai. Some of them have been torn down. Uh, most of them, a lot of them are still, still around. Uh, they were all confiscated by the Chinese government in 1949 when the communists took over. The one on the right is, a, is called a children's palace uh, where kids go and learn how to do Chinese dances. And the one on the left is a bar. <laughs> Uh, Drew, I have a question. What caused the demise of the shul in 1861? You're talking about the shul in Kaifang? I, 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 I imagine so. Uh, yeah, so the shul in Kaifang, you know, the, the, the roots of the Kaifang community, Jewish community, had really uh, essentially been washed out by that point. You know, the, the, the community, the, 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 the Jewish culture was allowed to thrive until the end of the Ming Dynasty. And the Qing Dynasty, which began in 1644, uh, was a, it was a foreign dynasty, actually. It was Manchurians. And they frowned upon any kind of religious practices. So the Jews basically had to go underground from 1644 onward. Uh, the building remained until 1861, when it was, when it was torn down. Uh, my understanding is that they weren't allowed to use it for practice. Um, so, you know, it, it was almost forgotten, essentially. I mean, people knew that it was an ancient synagogue, but it hadn't been used for many years. And uh, another question, how did the Jews in Shanghai fare against during the Nazis? And you may, uh, I'm not sure that you may get to that, but. That is coming up. <laughs> okay, so I don't wait till we get there. And one more question before you move yep. on. Yep. Was there evidence in the Shanghai cuisine of Jewish influence besides the absence of pork? Um, in the Kaifeng Jews, actually, I'm not familiar with anything else. Um, you know, Kaifeng is way inland, so they wouldn't be eating shellfish anyway. Okay. Um, but, you know, that's the, the stories that I've heard, the anecdotal stories I've heard are all about not eating pork. Okay. And, and what happened to the Torah scrolls? The Torah scrolls that were in Kaifeng? I I, I'm assuming were... that's what it, yeah, I, I guess yeah. that's what it is. So the Kaifeng Torah scrolls were long, long lost. Remember, there was no practicing Judaism after 1644. There's a story about a couple of scrolls. If you hold on, we'll get to that in a minute. Okay, minute. great. Wonderful stories. Okay, so let's go on. So the third wave, also a really interesting wave. These were Russian Jews, Russian-speaking Jews, um, who were fleeing uh, the pogroms, uh, the, the earliest pogroms in Warsaw in 1881. 
but in particular the pogroms that began in, in Kishinev uh, in, um, uh, in 1903 and 1904 um, forced you know, migration of a lot of Jews out of the Pale of Settlement. They actually found a really interesting route to safety um, which I'll tell you about in a minute, but this was actually a this is a this is a, a, a cartoon drawing that was that was made uh, just after the Kishinev uh, Kishinev pogrom, um, mm. which some of you may recognize, but it's, it's it's a really interesting depiction of you know the beginning of this diaspora away from the Pale and going way east to the to the Siberian frontier. So these were. Obviously, these were Ashkenazi Russian-speaking Jews. They were middle-class Jews. They left to escape. And I apologize for those pictures. These are aftermath of the pogrom in Kishinev. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to read you this part. I'm going to show you this story on this map. So basically what happened, these guys who were, you know, very entrepreneurial, a lot of them were, you know, small businessmen. They made their way all the way across to what they thought was probably the safest distance <laughs> they could probably they could possibly get from the czar. Some of them settled in in Siberia, but a lot of them settled in that area where there's there's, there's a circle, which is the port of Vladivostok. Um, you know, they landed there between 1881, 82, and 1903, 1904, 1905, I guess. Um, they set up their businesses. They became uh, they, they set up factories, they were manufacturers, they were in garments, they were in uh, wood making. Um, they were very, it was a small community, a couple of thousand, but they were very successful business people. Um, <clears throat> and then something really interesting happened in 1903, 1904, 1905. Um, so if you know your history, you'll know that uh, uh, Japan was really emerging as a great power uh, in that part of the world. Um, the Russians were very concerned that the Japanese were coming around to threaten them, in particular in their sphere of influence in that part of Asia. Um, and over the course of 1904, there started a, a, a naval war between the, the Russians and the Japanese. And the Russians were one of the great powers, obviously, they were one, one of the great world dynasties, but the Japanese completely sank the whole uh, flotilla that was based both in Vladivostok and in uh, Dalian, which is in those days it was called Port Arthur. The Russian warm water fleet and the cold water fleet were both sunk completely by the Japanese and the Russians and the rest of the world were flabbergasted. They couldn't figure out how this possibly had happened. And one of the things that they excavated that might have caused it was that the Jews who were based in Vladivostok had been spying for the Japanese because of their insights into Russia, the Russian government, the fact that they could speak Russian, they had infiltrated the Russian Navy and were sending intelligence to the Japanese Navy, which allowed the Japanese to sink the whole Russian fleet. And with that, they were essentially summarily dismissed <laughs> from, from Russia. And they left and they, most of them went kind of northwest to that town called Harbin, they settled there, <clears throat> they, they brought their businesses, they built their factories, they built, they built synagogues, as you can tell. Uh, many, more many more Jews then came uh, through Siberia and into China, fleeing the Bolshevik rebellion as well. Um, so, you know, by the 20s and 30s, early 30s, Harbin was also a thriving Jewish community, probably with about three, 4,000 Jews living in it. And then the Japanese, the Japanese invaded Northern China uh, beginning in the early thirties um, and took over this section that they called Manchuria, uh, created a puppet state with the, the old emperor as the, the king, Pui, and basically had very little tolerance for outsiders. They were afraid uh, that the Jews would turn against them to a certain extent, made it uncomfortable enough that the Jews said, look, we're moving, we're going down, we're going to, going to Shanghai. So at that point, they moved, uh, they began moving south towards Shanghai. Okay, so here we are, Shanghai. And there's actually some really interesting literature, some great stories about the Jews, uh, the Harbin and the Russian Jews in Shanghai. 
Uh, Sam Mashinsky has came to visit our, our community about six or seven years ago. He's quite old, but he was a Russian Jew who lived in China until 1949. Um, and he was a part of that community as his grandparents had come uh, over. So the fourth wave, this is one that a lot of people do know about, I think. <clears throat> right after, these were Jews that uh, left uh, uh, Europe soon after Kristallnacht. They were actually coming even before Kristallnacht. Um, as many of you may know, um, in 1938, the great powers got together at this Evian conference and among the many things that they decided was that they were gonna shut their borders to Jewish immigration. So when Kristallnacht took place and the Jews began to flee, <clears throat> they really had no place to go because all of those countries were closed. And there are stories of Jews finding their way to Amsterdam and to ports in Italy and going up and down the coast of the United States and of Europe looking for ports that would take them and being refused everywhere they went. Um, Shanghai was one of the only cities in the world that was open to them. Uh, Costa Rica, oddly enough, was the was one of the other ones. Um, but in order to get out and to find their way to Shanghai, they needed to have some kind of a travel document, some papers that would allow them to get through all the checkpoints that the Nazis had established. Um, and in the course of the period between you know, just before Kristallnacht and at the end of 1940, there were two amazing stories. One was a Japanese diplomat. One was a mainland uh, nationalist government diplomat um, who over the course of months, in one case a month and a half, decided that they were gonna save as many Jews as they possibly could. Um, I'm gonna tell you their stories a little bit more in the future, but uh, in, in, in a later slide. Um, but basically over the over the course of those few months, they issued visas to almost 10,000 Jews, most of which found their way to the only port that was available to them. These Jews arrived in Shanghai. I'll, I'll show you some pictures later. Um, sorry, these are those. These are those two. Uh, um, sorry, I can't see my slide. Righteous Gentiles, Gentiles. Um, and I, I put righteous Gentiles because they've been recognized by Yad Vashem among the righteous Gentiles of the world uh, because of the work that they did to save, save all of those Jews. And both of them had been told by their superiors not to do what they did. Um, Sugihara, uh, Chune Sugihara, um, who was the consul general in Kanes, Lithuania, literally over the course of a month and a half, having been told that he had been uh, basically called back uh, to, to Tokyo, spent his last month and a half physically writing exit papers, transport papers, nonstop for 20 hours a day and wrote, prepared 6,000 6, of these. There were Jews coming from all over the Pale of Settlement because they had heard about this man and he, the story goes, and I've seen pictures of this, as he left, he was being run out on the train. He was throwing the last transport papers out the window to the Jews that he had met earlier that morning. Um, he Fengshan is a, a very similar story. Uh, he was the Chinese consul general in Vienna. And again, he had been recalled, but over the last couple of months while he was there, he issued 2000 visas. Um, and the estimates are that uh, between these two men, there are about 200,000 Jews that are alive today because of the, the work that they did. There we go. Uh, just one comment that uh, uh, Louise made that the Dominican Republic also allowed Jews fleeing the Nazis. Yes, that was, that was the only other place where they were, right. where they were welcome. Um, I'm not sure, I don't know if anybody knows how many Jews actually went to the DR at that point. Uh, but I know 20,000 ended up, ended up in Shanghai. So here's a view of them arriving on these boats, basically with very little coming through the immigration stations, which as you can tell, were not manned by Chinese. They were, they were manned by, excuse me, the Baghdadi Jews uh, created the welcoming societies. So they were, they were the ones who were manning and taking care of. There was like a, basically a version of the, of the joint 
at that point uh, where they were taking care of the Jews and getting them settled. And, you know, for the first few years they were in Shanghai, uh, there was such a thing as a Jewish life. Um, they, there was lots of references to this concept of Little Vienna. There was a neighborhood in, in Shanghai where uh, <clears throat> a lot of these refugees Jews lived. So many of them were from Vienna that they created, you know, this sense of, you know, there were, there were pastry shops and there were bakeries and there were restaurants and there were small bars and things. And, you know, there are bakers and things there and there was there was Jewish services and there was a the Jewish Chronicle of Shanghai as you could see on the right Jewish sports teams the guys even had the mug and velvet on their on their jackets um, so there was a, a bit of the culture that began to emerge uh, in the first few years they were there um, but as the war went on it, as you know probably the Japanese controlled China um, for most of the war I'm sorry and you'll see that there someone who was asking about Torah scrolls. There was a, a, a thriving you know, Jewish community, very active, uh, several different synagogues that were active, some of them in what later became the Jewish ghetto, uh, and then the, the, the big old ones that were set up by the Sephardis. Uh, everybody had, whoops, I'm sorry, everybody had their transport papers, their landing papers, their papers to be able to move around, but they lived life uh, in a relatively free way. And then <clears throat> the Japanese um, who had, you know, essentially controlled all of China came, uh, eventually took over even the foreign concessions of Shanghai that, that were, you know, officially part of Great Britain and France and other foreign, foreign countries. Uh, but the Japanese invaded and took over all of Shanghai. Um, soon thereafter, the, uh, Hitler sent his emissary uh, Joseph Meisinger to Shanghai to e explain to the Japanese how they were supposed to exterminate the Jews. Um, and there are all kinds of, of stories about how that was planned and how the discussion went. But in the end, the Japanese decided to ignore the order. There are millions of stories of why, explanations of why they, they ignored the order. Um, you know, some related to, you know, they, 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 they thought there were going to be a world power at the end of the war and they didn't want to alienate the Americans. Uh, my favorite version is that, uh, in fact, remember that story about the Russo-Japanese naval war, that the Jews were spying on behalf of the Japanese on the Russians. Um, I have heard several anecdotes that that was the reason, because these, these were military men. They knew. They knew the, <clears throat> they knew the benefit uh, that had come from that kind of intelligence. So that's one of the, 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 the reasons uh, in, the, in the anecdotes about why the, the Jews were not exterminated, why they weren't sent off to barges and, and the barges exploded. Uh, but they were ghettoized. Uh, they were sent into a 10 by 10 square block area, 20,000 Jews in a, you know, very, it was, it was, at that point, it was already a very poor part of the city, uh, very close quarters. And <clears throat> they were put under the charge of a Japanese officer uh, his name was Goya, famous in all stories of Jew Jews in Shanghai during World War II. He was a tyrant and sadist, um, and he referred to himself as the king of the Jews. Uh, apparently, he was like four foot nine or four foot ten, and he, he liked getting up on his desk and screaming in tirades and you know threatening threatening the Jews whenever they asked for anything. He's just he's a crazy man. And ghetto life was very different than Little Vienna. They lived in extremely close quarters. Uh, there was dysentery. There was lots of diseases. Um, there were no walls. Uh, they were, there were fences. They had to stay in. They needed to have tr uh, transit permits to leave. As you can see, the one at the lower left has a stamp of, you know, basically every day this gentleman went in and went out. Uh, he's got a stamp on his, on, his, uh, on his transit visa to leave the ghetto. Uh, interestingly enough, the latest date on that, I don't know if you could see that, is August 31st, 1945, which is, uh, what, 20 days after Pearl Harbor, after the Japanese uh, Japanese surrendered. Um, so this, uh, uh, this ghettoization actually didn't end until, you know, uh, quite a few days after the armistice was actually signed. But they did, they, they lived in this ghetto, this very tight quarters in the Hongko district, but they did have a shul. And this shul, you'll see in the picture on the left, this very nondescript building on the outside. On the inside was this glorious three-story uh, building, which was used 
by the, the Jewish refugees, <clears throat> uh, the Austrian and the Polish and the German Jews who lived in the ghetto. This was their ghetto shul. Uh, it was called Ochel of Moishe. And some of you may have seen these books. There are lots written, uh, there are documentaries um, about this period in Shanghai. Uh, some of you may have seen the movie Empire of the Sun that takes place in Shanghai about this time. There's not, not a lot to do with the Jews, but there's, there's a, a lot of the color of the story is also depicted in that, in that film. So that, that synagogue, Ochel Moshe, um, after the mutual recognition of, by China, of Israel and Israel by China, uh, the Chinese began to recognize the value of this relationship. There, there had been a very close trading relationship between the two countries. Chinese have always had an enormous respect for Israel and the Jews. And they decided rather than tearing down this building uh, in, a, in a massive uh, uh, renovation that was happening around it, they decided to keep this building and turn it into a museum uh, to the refugees of uh, Kristallnacht and, and World War II. So these pictures are you know, some of these very, it's very moving place, somewhat enclosed. And there's a, a long wall here with the names of, all of the names that they could find of the Jews who, who, who lived in the ghetto uh, for a period of time. I, th I don't think there are as many as 20,000, but there are probably 15,000 names inscribed on this wall. Um, sculptures like that. If you go to Shanghai, you should visit. Um, and then the fifth wave. The fifth wave are Jews like me. Um, these are folks who came, you know, after China opened up in 1979, there were economic opportunities, there were educational opportunities, diplomats and stuff. Jews, uh, as, as, is their, as, as is their interest, uh, tend to go out and explore different places and were very early arriving in Shanghai. I, I, I landed in Shanghai for the first time. I lived in another city for the first few years I was in China. I landed in Shanghai in 1990, um, and there were already, there were probably 300 Jews in town when I arrived there. Um, business people, uh, educators, uh, government officials, uh, you know, there were diplomats there. Um, and, you know, as I was alluding to this earlier, you know, Judaism is not officially recognized as a religion in China. Uh, the only religions that are recognized are Buddhism, Taoism, Muslim, Islam. Uh, Protestant, Protestant, Protestantism and Catholicism. Um, and Jews are very tightly restricted as to the activities that they can perform. And it's completely restricted to foreigners. Um, you are not allowed to invite Chinese people into any kind of organization that's set up by, by Jews. Um, there's now there are exceptions made for spouses. My wife, for example, could come if she wanted to. Um, but Judaism is still restricted to very small circles of, of essentially of foreigners. But having said that, there are quite a few Jewish uh, Jewish groups and congregations established in China. Uh, Chabad was very early uh, to come. Actually, when I came, there was an organization, a very loose organization of uh, of the liberal Jews. <clears throat> and then Chabad came in 1999, extremely well organized, um, bought a house, created a Jewish center of Shanghai, got extremely well organized, built a mikvah, um, and essentially uh, coordinated uh, a new version of Jewish life, uh, both in Shanghai and Beijing, and then eventually in a bunch of other cities, to the point where now they have three different uh, rabbis in three different locations, um, all of which are villas, essentially, that are used as shuls. Um, but in addition to that, um, you know, Chabad is uh, quite strict in many ways um, for families like ours. And there are a lot of families like mine where, you know, it's a, it's a mixed racial marriage. Uh, maybe people come from somewhat more liberal Jewish backgrounds than the orthodox uh, view of the Chabad. Um, and it wasn't for us as my kids were born um, and uh, you know, we were, my, my wife and I had been married quite a while. It wasn't a place where we felt welcome. Um, and we and many other like-minded Jewish families, there are about 10 families, decided to establish our own grassroots uh, kehelat uh, uh, based in Shanghai. 
there had been a Kehe lot in Beijing. Um, we were uh, in contact with them, but it, we essentially started as a bunch of 10 families uh, reaching out to rabbis around the world, asking them to come in for high holy days and for, for Pesach, uh, leading services for us, then doing our best to teach our children, creating schools and classes. Ultimately, about four or five years ago, uh, we were able to hire a community organizer. Um, and now uh, our community in Shanghai, this is actually a picture of Ohera Chel, which is the old Sephardic synagogue, which is actually more, it's usually used by uh, Chabad. This is a Chabad service. Um, I've been to a few of these. They're actually very, very nice. Um, but our shul, um, the Kehelat Shanghai uh, congregation that uh, a bunch of families and, and I set up about 10 years ago, is now this thriving group of, they're probably, there are 200 or so families and four or 500 people who are involved in one way or another. Um, this is a, we, we call this a, a tribe B'nai Mitzvah, four different kids decided they didn't want to do their own bar, bar, bar mitzvahs by, bar and bat mitzvahs by themselves. So we did a community bar mitzvah in, uh, in the shul, in the old refugee shul, which you see in the background. Um, using uh, an old Torah, and I'll tell you the story of this Torah, but as you can tell, it's a very old Torah, it's not in great shape, but we were able to uh, use the shul, use the Torah in ways where our kids have, you know, direct relationships with their history and with their culture. Um, not an easy thing. So much so, this is, uh, this is one of the, this was the very first actually full community bar mitzvah uh, in Kehelat, Shanghai. That's my son. That's his bar mitzvah. Very special moment, kind of a coming together of, of our community uh, and a major celebration. It was a wonderful day. Those of you who know Jamin probably won't recognize that short pudgy guy. And he's now six foot tall and lean as a bean. Yeah. And it's a very vibrant community. It's now, you know, there are all kinds of different groups and activities. There's singles groups, there's an entrepreneurs group, there's a business group, there's, we do community events like community seders, et cetera, et cetera. There's a big adult and kids education program, visiting scholars, talks like this all the time. It's a very vibrant community. No permanent rabbi, but at a grassroots level, it's, uh, it's going strong. So I'm happy to tell you that the, the Jews in Shanghai are around. Now I wanna end this with a, a quick story. Uh, this is what I call the story of the magical traveling Torah. Um, this line actually comes from an article that was written about this story uh, in an Australian, Australian Jewish network, I think that's what it's called. This is the front page on the, on the left. It says, what do a fragile Torah, a bar mitzvah boy and a government minister have in common? Okay, I'll take you through this story. You remember that Torah? <clears throat> that, that Torah, it's like, it's, it's yellowed, it's falling apart, it's ripped, it's torn, it's, it's falling off of its, uh, of its rolls. It wasn't in very good shape at that point. And one of the reasons why is because that Torah, that very Torah came to Shanghai in 1939 with Jews escaping the Holocaust. Wow. It was used throughout the period uh, of, uh, of the, the, the Jewish occupation, well, the, the, the Jewish time in, in Shanghai from 1938 all the way through 1949, 1950, as one of the, I think there was more than one, but this was the main scroll that was used in our synagogue in, in uh, Ochel Moshe. It, was taken when the Jews left and you know, when the communists uh, took over China in 1949, it became a lot more difficult for the Jews to stay. Most of them might emigrated to uh, Australia and South Africa and the US, uh, some went to South America. This Torah was taken uh, with a group of Jews who went to uh, Rio de Janeiro and, and stayed in uh, apparently in the back of an ark uh, one of the one of the scrolls that was not used in that temple for 50 years. When our <clears throat> when our community was established, uh, it it was pretty big news around the liberal Jewish community, and there were quite a few articles written about us. And this uh, community in, um, in in Rio heard about us and reached out and said, "Look, we have your Torah." 
they knew the history of the Torah because the, there was institutional memory. The person who had brought it had a, you know, their family was still involved in the shul. He said, we have your Torah and we'd like to give it back. So uh, about five years ago, we had this really wonderful emotional ceremony where one of our, one of our board members went to Rio, picked up the, 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 uh, the Torah and brought it back. And from that point onward, it was used for all of our great ceremonies and events. On the right-hand side, we had a visiting rabbi from Boston. His name is David Wolfman. Some of you may know him, who gave us like a physical relationship with the Torah. We, we, you know, we wanted the kids to touch it. We did a ceremony where he had all the kids sit down and he rolled the Torah out of just above their legs. He wrapped the whole room in the Torah one day, and it was just, you know, such an emotional period for for the whole group that. Uh, when Jamin had his bar mitzvah, he decided that the gift he wanted to give back to the shul was to renovate this Torah. Um, so he spent about three or four months finding a sofa rabbi who was close enough uh, and willing enough to take on this really incredible job. I think he was baited by the great story of this magical traveling Torah too. Um, and so how else do you get a Torah to Australia? Well, you pack it up in a fencing bag, of course. So <laughs> we, we packed it in a fencing bag. We, a dear friend of mine was traveling home to, to Sydney at the time. He carried it, uh, carried it, like literally carried it. He got special dispensation to bring this extra long bag on the plane, uh, got it to the sofa. It took about four months to repair. And then we couldn't get it back. We couldn't find anybody who could bring it back. Um, and then through you know the Jewish network, a gentleman, whose father, uh, whose mother, sorry, was a Shanghai Jew who had left Shanghai, who had, you know, escaped. Uh, I think she was from Poland, I'm quite sure. She had escaped to Shanghai where, you know, she survived because Shanghai was there for her. She then, in 1949, left and went to Australia. Her son, I'm sorry, I don't remember. I think it's her grandson, um, then became a minister of commerce of the state of Victoria. And he got wind of this. He said, look, I do trips to China all the time. I'm going to bring this back to China. So this gentleman took this Torah scroll that had come from Germany to Shanghai to Rio de Janeiro, back to Shanghai, to Sydney, to Melbourne, where it was fixed, back to Shanghai. And that magical traveling Torah is is still the one and only scroll that's used by the Jewish community of Kekala Shanghai. Great. With that, I'll open it to so, questions. Uh, yeah, I have a question. Was there any migration of Jews to the U.S. after World War II? And this is from Howard. He says, my understanding is that one family, the Blumenthal family, came and one of its members actually was the Treasury Secretary in the 1970s and a business executive. Yes, actually. Um, so I don't know what the percentage was, but it was qu quite a big chunk of the Jews uh, did come to the U.S. Uh, in fact, I, I knew one very well. There was, there was a quote uh, on one of these slides from a gentleman named Fred Fields. Uh, he was filmed as part of the Shoah project. Um, Fred was a Shanghainese Jew uh, who came and landed in the States at the age of, I think, 22 or something. He was part of a group of probably, I would bet there were probably 2,000 or so of those Jews who ended up in the States. And yes, they did They did very well. I've met a bunch of them. Uh, Blumenthal's, you're right, uh, Secretary of the Treasury at Blumenthal. I think actually mm -hmm. Richard Blumenthal, uh, who's the senator from Connecticut, my home state, um, I'm quite sure is related to that family as well. Great. So uh, there's a comment that I'm not going to read, and it's to everybody from Brad Bailey, Zay Hayatov Me'od, and then it looks like Chinese, Zhi Zhi Nin, <laughs> whatever that means. <laughs> I, I, I had no idea. <laughs> I knew Benny knew, knew a little bit of Chinese, but I didn't know Brad did. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right, there's, a, you could probably see the chat now yourself. There's something in Chinese from, <laughs> looks like it's from your son, <laughs> from Jamin. Shay Shay, <laughs> but I don't speak Chinese, so I can't. Shay Shay means thank you. Yeah. Okay, great. So if you have any, if there are any more questions for this amazing presentation, I'm 
totally fascinated by the story. This was wonderful. Um, So, uh, all right, so Cantor Jeff has one. He has a comment. Great, thank, thank you, okay. Drew. Thank you, Drew, so much. And I feel really happy and proud to have been part of the crew that welcomed your amazing family to our happy town and who has had the wonderful opportunity to work with your, the mutt who you described before. <laughs> your wonderful, wonderful, amazing family. So I feel very blessed. I just wanted to mention, and I know when I first met Drew, I, I mentioned this. So some of us saw Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish and know about the Folksbina Yiddish Theater uh, in New York, which is now called the National Yiddish Theater of Folksbina. And the artistic director is an old friend named Zalman Blotek. And his father and some of his relatives were part of that wave of Sugihara Jews. Uh, they went to Kovno Kaunas and they got a visa and they survived. Uh, the war in, in, in Shanghai. And so another just little bit of Shanghai Jewish lore, uh, you know, became very, very important to Yiddish in the United States and, and important more recently in Fiddler on the Roof in Yiddish. So that's a Shanghai connection. And we, we had a uh, question from Jerry Kaufman. Were there any um, prayer books uh, trans, transliterated in Chinese? Oh, um, interesting. So we we actually have one, um, but it wasn't uh, translated for religious purposes. There's actually a, at Nanjing University, and I think one other, there's a Department of Jewish Studies, believe it or not. And they've done quite a bit of work in translating, you know, the Torah and then Talmud and, you know, a lot of other, you know, a lot of a lot, a lot of other pieces of Jewish literature. Um, because, you know, officially, if you're Chinese, you're not allowed to worship in China. Um, so, you know, they, I, I think they have to be very careful about the way they publish, they print, and they distribute anything that's a translation of the Torah. <laughs> okay. Um, well, I, if there, I don't know if there are any other questions. I, yeah. Yes, go ahead. Go. First of all, uh, Sugihara was honored by the Koppelman Holocaust Center at Ryder a few years ago. I didn't and, know that. Uh, he, he was actually honored uh, for what he had done in, in Lithuania and Kaunas. Uh, the other thing that's interesting, uh, my wife and I actually had visited Kaifeng about 20 years ago. And the synagogue was actually next to the, uh, the Muslim temple, which was really interesting. And the people were really friendly. But as you say, we were basically, um, observed by the Chinese um, authorities because they were very concerned about any religious activity. And uh, we were eventually, we were not hassled or anything, but it was really interesting. The people were actually very friendly when we told them who we were, we were Jewish and stuff, and they all talked about their relatives and things like that, which was very interesting. So it was a very interesting experience. Great. Emily, you, Emily Pronin, you have your hands up. Did you have a question? I had a, I had a comment, yeah. Um, I just wanted to say that, just thank you so much for this talk. My grandfather and his two brothers and two sisters all um, escaped the Nazis and um, after being in the camps. And my grandfather's brother, Max, who I grew up calling Uncle Max, um, I didn't find out until years after his death, I saw this sort of um, little sculpture on my mom's table of these sort of ivory looking elephants. And I said, that's so beautiful, mom, what is that? And she said, it belonged to your uncle Max who brought it back from Shanghai. And that's how I found out that he, of all the brothers and the sisters, he was the only one who had escaped via Shanghai. And I always was so interested to know about that part of, of history of the um, Jews who escaped the Nazis and went to Shanghai. And so thank you so much for this. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that story. It actually, you know, it resonates so much because um, they're, Jew, Jews who were saved at that time because of Shanghai are, they're everywhere. And their children and their grandchildren come back to Shanghai. And one of the most wonderful things about being, you know, involved in the, the Jewish community there um, in particular, close friends with the man who runs the, the Jew, Jew tour of Shanghai, this amazing Israeli guy, 
is that you get to meet these people. And some of them are quite old. I mean, some of the people who come to Shanghai, at least in the early days, were people who, who grew up in Shanghai themselves. Um, and then, you know, a lot of them are children and their, their, their stories are rich with you know, things that their, their parents told them uh, as they were growing up. And it's just, you know, for every single person, it is the most emotional part of their family lore. Um, and it's mysterious and it's exciting. And, you know, and they, you know, people tell stories like this, you know, I have nothing left from Shanghai, but I have this one trinket, you know. Or, you know, I, I, can, I can't say a word of Mandarin, but I remember these five phrases in Shanghainese, you know? <laughs> it's just, it's, it's wonderful to meet those people. And, and in fact, they, there are a lot of them out there. And it's, it's just wonderful to know there are so many out there. Yeah, Drew, I, I have, still have a couple of comments coming in. So if you're willing to hang on for a little longer. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> okay, so from Debbie Dunn-Solomon, the question, how do neighbors colleagues, kids, teachers, anyone treat the Jews today there? Is there anti-Semitism or is it something Jews would not just mention? It's a really interesting question. So in modern China, there's this really interesting bias uh, that Jews are brilliant, uh, beyond brilliant, I would say. It's like, you know, there's some different races and groups that are brilliant, but there's something about Jews that are just like mystically brilliant. Um, great business people, uh, they're like Chinese, you know, <laughs> great businessmen like we Chinese are. Um, so there's a certain amount of reverence uh, that, uh, that that kind of goes through Chinese culture that, uh, you know, when I, when I was first there, being a foreigner already kind of puts you up on a pedestal, but being a Jewish foreigner was, you know, there you were, uh, two, two, two uh, badges for your credentials. Um, that, I think that sense among the population is still the same. China, it, China has changed in the last 10 years or so in its attitudes toward foreigners in general. Um, and I wouldn't call it out and out anti-Semitism, but there's much more of a feeling of, you know, foreigners, we don't need you anymore, all the way to, we don't want you anymore. Um, and it tends, unfortunately, it tends to get a little bit ugly when people identify you as something like Jewish. Um, so I, I wouldn't say it's anti-Semitism for anti-Semitism's sake. It's more like a label that's used as part of the overall like nationalistic uh, anger at the outside world. Um, but I, I got to tell you, I mean, having been a Jew in, in China for all of those years, I, I lived in China for more than 30 years altogether. I don't remember once having someone look at me and say, you're, you're Jewish and anything but, oh, my God, you must be so smart. <laughs> almost like a, a, a line that's at the tip of everybody's tongue when the word Jewish comes out of their mouths. Oh, <laughs> Nicholas, <Yeah. laughs> Sherry, yeah, I see you have your hand up. Oh, thanks. Um, I wanted to say that as someone who's been doing a bit of genealogical research during this pandemic, I am shocked to know that relatives who came here like 1910 and before had so many siblings, aunts, first cousins who were affected by the Holocaust, which being online on ancestry and heritage, now one can find with census documents like who these people were. And when you think your family wasn't affected by the Holocaust, you can really find out where they traveled to. And some of those family trees that I'm finding people did go um, to China. So even if you think your family didn't, it's possible they did. And that this moment of being online the way we are and all these documents being scanned <coughs> is like no other to find out. Um, I did put in, uh, in the chat a specific article about the difference between maternal and paternal inheritance and, and patrilineal and matrilineal. And it turns out that the genetic test that you get to prove your inheritance, whether you think you're a Native American or uh, a, a Chinese Jew, um, that it, this, the matrilineal and patrilineal um, inheritance, not all genetic tests are equal in that regard. Mm -hmm. And uh, I left the link there because it's, it's above my pay grade to explain it to you all, but I thought that um, you might find it very interesting and there might be something to revisit there. Great, thank you. So I want to take this opportunity to thank Drew for this amazing presentation and so interesting. And I know we all learned so much 
and it was just fascinating. So thank you, Drew. It was wonderful. And I just want to give you guys a heads up. Uh, our next, we have kind of a bonus Great Mind Salon coming up on February 18th. I know you're not going to want to miss it. Um, Adrian Bardon, who is uh, Joan Levin's son-in-law, wrote a book called The Truth About Denial, Bias, and Self-Deception in Science. And he is going to do a presentation on the what, how, and why of science denial. So please put February 18th on your calendar for the next Great Mind Salon. And many thanks to all of you who participated tonight and a very, very special thanks to Drew for a wonderful presentation. Have a great evening, everybody. Stay safe, stay warm. And I will see you hopefully on February 18th. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, hey. Thank you so much. Hi, Jamin. Thank you. That was wonderful. Hi, guys. Thank you. Thank you, thank you uh, Drew. And thank you, Ellen. What a great job moderating. Thank you. Oh, thank, thank you. you. <laughs> thank you all. Thank wonderful. You. Jamin, hi. <laughs> <laughs> Where's Zoe? <laughs> She doesn't share the screen with them anymore. They just. Uh, I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. Hey, hey. Oh, no, wait, 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 wait. Hey. Hi. Hi. Hi, Zoe. <laughs> I've seen them on the same screen. I'm just saying. <laughs> I have seen them on the same screen at the same time. It doesn't end well. They hugged. And it was a hug. It wasn't a strangulation. It was a hug. <laughs> oh, <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Thank you, Drew. This was great. That was so great. Thank you. Great. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Thank you, everyone. Bye. Just got a call from China. Got to go. <laughs> oh, uh oh. <laughs> it's 10 o'clock in the morning there, 11 o'clock. Yeah, nice. yeah, this is the problem. Yeah. Tell them, no, All right. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bye. Drew. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Ellen? Yes. Hey, actually, you, Adrian, hi. how are you? Oh, I'm great. How are you? Good, good. I actually, I was going to write you an email, but if you were able to stick around for a minute, I'd like to ask you about sure. the. Uh, I'm stuck in my ass. I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> oh. um, I'm not interrupting. Am I interrupting someone's conversation? I don't no. think so. I'm okay. All right. Yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, nice to see you. And but that was great. Yeah. Uh, that was super interesting. I didn't know any any of that. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I uh, as his daughter was in a class of mine, so I'd seen part of the presentation. And actually, my grandmother, I'm sure, when she left Russia, went through China. Uh, she spoke Chinese, so I, I don't know. You know, I don't know that much, but I knew a little bit about it. But it's a fascinating story, fascinating history. That was so cool. Um... I remember, for example, being in uh, in France in Avignon with with my wife Joan's daughter. Uh, and we I know visited, Jana from a long time ago. I, <laughs> of course, <laughs> with Jana, um, and uh, visiting the old uh, synagogue there, and they had also been, you know, there was almost no community left after the war, yeah. but the synagogue survived, and there was still a small community there. And the synagogue actually got destroyed, and they rebuilt it in this in this uh, neoclassical style. Mm -hmm. Neoclassical would be like like the U.S. Capitol, right? Building wow. with the or the Lincoln Memorial. Wow! And it was the weirdest looking synagogue. <laughs> but it was it was a kind of a gift to the remnants yeah. of the Jewish community. Anyway, but so it's it's really cool to find you know old synagogues in different parts of the world. You know what? We're all over the place. Yeah, <laughs> we Jews are like. And every uh, every part of the the world, we've managed to spread out everywhere and have you got, you got you got to keep your suitcase packed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I have that. How are the boys? I have my own family history of that. Um, yes. The uh, the uh, the the boys are boys are great. They're they're great. They're very energetic. Yeah, yeah. Boys. <laughs> <laughs> the boys will be boys. <laughs> Bouncing off the walls. Okay, so Ellen, I don't I don't want to yes. keep you, but so. 
there's so uh, I, I would I really wanted to get on here to kind of see how you do sure. things here. So th there's two formats that I can think of where, where like I would have like a one way and this is kind of the way I would normally do it would be I, I would have a presentation that would just sort of go on for like half an hour or 40 minutes right. and then we would have a separate question and answer. Now this one I noticed he sort of had material for virtually the whole hour and then you took right. questions during the talk do you have a preference for like no one right. or the so other this one when he went much longer with his presentation and a lot of the questions he, he was okay with me interrupting him and uh -huh. I offered him the the opportunity beforehand I had discussed it with him do you want me to interject or do you want to wait and mm -hmm. put aside a 15 minute Q&A and entertain all of the questions at that time he didn't care. It was okay. Now, the last, the one we did before this uh, was a presentation on media, and uh, it was, he's a, the fellow who did it is a, um, a reporter for CNBC, I think it is, and his presentation was about a half hour long, maybe 35 minutes, and mm -hmm. then the next 20, 25 minutes were all questions and discussion, and there were a lot of questions, and it took up the rest of the time. So, I mean, that's really up to you. If you feel like you have a longer presentation, I have a feeling the subject that you're going to be discussing, there are going to be a lot of questions and a lot of comments. I mean, it's a subject that's so important and so much so relevant right now. So my feeling is, there will be a lot of questions. So obviously this one went over, usually it's an hour, but I didn't want to cut anybody off. So I let it go okay. longer. So do you have a preference as to how you, you know, would you prefer a half hour presentation and a half hour Q and A, 45 minutes? And if it goes over, you know, it's up to you. Well, it's certainly I, I your I, choice. I certainly could do either one. I, I don't have a strong preference. I, I, I suspect that people like having time to raise their own issues and, and right, make their own right. questions. So, so I, I think I'm going to make it um, kind of as short as I can. Okay. Uh, and uh, try to keep it, try to keep the, yeah, you know, so between, you know, 30 to 35 minutes and, and I'll just okay. have to go. Yeah. I mean, I can't, I can't begin to cover all the things I could talk about in that time, Absolutely. but that, that's fine. Yeah, so my thought is maybe do 35 minutes yeah. and I won't interrupt you and save the questions for the Q&A. Well, ha, well, why don't we ju just make it 35 minutes, but you can interrupt me if somebody I really can. wants okay. to say something. Okay, and so that'll we'll just we, make it go a little longer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever, you know, I, and uh, I can I can adjust. I, 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 I can adjust on my feet to whatever's going on. Okay. Um, yeah. You know, I'm I mean, used to, I'm used to doing these things. I, I, I'm, I know. Be, I know be you've fine. been interviewed on uh, several TV channels and uh, things like that. So oh I know. My, I, oh, my goodness. I had, I've had, yeah. I had quite a year. I can imagine. Well, I mean, the subject is so yes. relevant. I mean, you know, we're all interested in that. And uh, yeah, I have to say, as a, you know, I know Joan for many, 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 many years, and Jana and Rachel and, and David. I'm very proud of you as Joan's son-in-law. <laughs> so no. kudos to you on this wonder, the, the, your accomplishments in the book. Uh, wonderful. I'm just, I'm just living in the shadow of my in-laws, <laughs> um, trying to live up to their example. Yes. Um, listen, yes. I, what, th so this, there's all kinds of subject matters. Uh, so there's, there's climate change is kind of central. Right. To what I talk about, but I can also, um, uh, I was talking to actually to Joan about this earlier today and I could sort of talk about uh, masks. I can talk about vaccines. I would say Does the masks and the vaccines and of course, climate change are the probably because of the vaccines going on now and the, the, the new mask mandate that President Biden has, uh, you know, yeah. proposed about on. So those are the most relevant what, of what's going on today in, in the news and in the world. So, uh, but I trust that whatever you do, it's going to be very interesting and, and people will have a lot of questions and, and comments. I don't, I don't have all the answers though. 
No, no, I don't think anybody expects you to, but uh, you could make believe you do. There. You could just pretend to have all the answers. Well, that's what the academic types generally right. do. Right, right. So, so, so sometimes it just, you, you know, there's stuff going on out there. I, I, I really can't even, I still can't even get my head around. No, I'm not sure that any of us can. Well, so, so we'll try to do, work it out together. Yeah, and you know, you, you saw how it went tonight. It's yeah. It, it, the people are interested. They ask the question. It'll it'll be great. I am really looking forward to it, and I'm so thrilled that Joan presented the you know proposed you being a part of that, this program. I'm thrilled, and uh, we're really looking forward to it. So. Well, I'm 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 really I'm really honored by the yeah. invitation. And I, I so my much. husband and I are getting our vaccinations on Monday. The oh. first vaccinations. I do not deny science. <laughs> Mazel tov for that. Thank you. <laughs> I, I, if I, we don't I, have I, a snowstorm, you know, the, the oh. if it snows, we won't be able. But I'm keeping well, my fingers. Well, crossed. congratulations. I, I'm <laughs> I'm look. I'm really looking forward to that. I, fortunately, Jan and I are both educators, so we actually come into the next group. Um, right. Not, you know, my not, daughter is an educator yeah. also. Yeah. And um, I feel like she should be getting uh, her vaccine now. You know, they want to open the schools in the college. The my granddaughter is at, at in the honors program at Rutgers, and she everything is virtual because the, it, they should be getting vaccinations. The professors, you know, we're, we're but, having an, we're having an outbreak at Wake Forest right now. Really, and we might we, they, the students are in, are at in class. This was our first full week, and we had an outbreak this week. And there's a big meeting tomorrow. We might be going online. Basically, we started this semester, and we might be in the process of just crashing and burning completely. Wow, actually. yeah, it, it's a shame. I mean, it's it look, it's a, a new world, and it's something we haven't had to deal with in a hundred years. And look, uh, during the Spanish flu, they didn't have Zoom, so they really were in bad shape. So, uh, but hopefully, by the summer, maybe. I don't we'll know. All... I, I, I'm not so crazy about Zoom, but. No, I'm not either. You know, not I, I on teach not... on Zoom. I teach yeah. in the religious school on Zoom, and uh, I yeah. was never particularly technologically, uh, you know, good. But now I am. Look, I can do right. this. So you learn yeah. when you have to learn. You know. No, Zoom is Zoom is actually terrific. I I just don't want to actually live here for the rest of my life. No, I don't blame you. I don't blame you at all. So I'll do. I'll have um slides again, like um. Uh, Drew did. Yeah, I'll Good. I'll be in touch with you a, okay. a, a little bit before if you want to just send me the link to your slides just in case there's any wonky stuff with technology and which I I don't okay. anticipate. But generally, you can be in you'll be in control of your share screen and your your presentation, and it'll be great. Okay, so. once I have them all, I'm, they're not ready for this uh, exact presentation yet, but I'll I'll, get, I'll be getting them fixed up. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Wonderful Ellen. talking to you and seeing you on Zoom. <laughs> nice to see you. And, and I'll see you again uh, soon then. Give my best to Jan and the boys. It's Lev and Ben, right? Benjamin? Oh, no, that's, that's a different part of the family. It's, it's Zev with the Z. Zev. Zev and, Zev and Max. And Max. Okay. I know there are a lot of grandsons and I'm, <laughs> there's, there's an Oliver, yeah, we, I think. Yeah. So, yeah, there's, there's a there's a band. Okay, Zev, Asher, Zev and some, Max. Well, give Noah, give Maya. Jan and the boys my best, and I look forward to seeing you on the 18th. I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Thank you I'll so be much. In Ella. touch. Take care, Adrian. Bye bye. bye. Oh my God. <laughs>